talk about the Bohr model of the atom. So what is the accepted model of the atom? It is not the Bohr model of the atom. So oh, there's, okay. a, there's a quantized model of the atom. But the Bohr, he was wrong. He was totally wrong about his model. But he got one thing right in that he said it was quantized, so we give him a lot of credit. Okay. So if you look at the nucleus of an atom, what's in there? Protons and neutrons. And so what charge overall should it have? Zero. How about positive? Because neutrons don't have a charge. <laughs> Sweet. So if I have an electron out here, hovering out here somewhere in some sort of electron cloud, how does it feel about that nucleus? Pretty negative. No, oh, it likes it. He's negative. Nucleus is positive. There's an attraction going on right here. So he likes it. So if you look, how does this marker feel about the Earth right now? He likes it a lot. In fact, if I let this marker go, he's going to go to the Earth that he loves. By what force? Gravity. gravity. Well, in this case, it's not gravity. We call it the Coulombic force, but it's plus minus attraction, right? So, and if you let something go, it goes closer to where it wants. Now, when I hold this marker above the Earth, it has what kind of energy? It's more of a physics thing. Actually, as it's moving down, it has kinetic, but right now it has potential energy because that's the potential to fall, if you will. So if I hold it down here instead, does it have more or less potential energy? The same. No, the closer it is to the Earth, how much potential energy does it have now? It doesn't have any because it's on the Earth. It turns out the higher it is above the Earth, the greater the potential to fall. So the closer something gets to where it wants to go, the less potential energy it has. So in this case, if I have two electrons here, which one has more potential energy? So actually, so this guy, that's further away from what he loves. So the one that's, the closer you get, the lower your potential energy. So the closer you get to where you want to be, and they love this nucleus. So the closer you are in, the lower your potential energy. Well, it turns out Mr. Bohr looked at that and said, okay, there are certain circular radiuses, radii, around the nucleus here. But it turns out, you know, that they're only at certain distances. So you might have a radius right here and right here, but there's not a radius in between. So you can have an energy for that electron that corresponds to exactly this radius or exactly to this radius, but you can't have any of these intermediate energies at all. It's not possible. He said that only certain quantities of energy were possible for this electron. So it turned out, you know, he said they're in these nice circular orbits. And these orbits, there's an infinite number of them, and they just keep working their way out. They get a little closer together as you go out and stuff like that. But he said there's an infinite number of them. Do we now know that electrons really go in circular orbits around the nucleus? Jump all over the place. Yeah, and they're in these, they're not in orbits, but we now call them orbitals instead. And they're not necessarily circular. S orbitals are spherical, but spherical like a bowling ball, not like a hollow shell. So. And P's are like the dumbbell shapes, and D's look like four-leaf clovers and stuff, but they're not these circular orbits. So Bohr was wrong. His model was off. They're not circular orbits. But he proposed this because it worked for hydrogen. Turns out he looked at hydrogen and did some things with the absorption emission spectra, and it worked. And it didn't work for any other elements so that weren't ionized anyways. And so turns out his model was wrong as far as circular orbits and stuff, but the fact that electrons only exist at certain energies, at certain radii is what he pr proposed, was correct. And that's what we get him credit for. The idea that electron could be here or here and never in between, that was just like, what? That makes no sense. Well, it turns out it's the way the atom really exists in a certain way. So in this case, it turns out we call each of these nowadays corresponding to different shells of electrons. So and we label them with quantum numbers here. This is the principal quantum number, the first shell, the second shell, the third shell. These are analogous to like 1s, 2s, and 2p, 3s, 3p, and 3d. That's what these actually correspond to. And it turns out he actually calculated exactly what the energy of any one of these electrons in any shell was going to be. And so from a simple calculation, for hydrogen anyways, you could calculate, depending on where the electron was, exactly how much energy it has. So what would an, uh, how much energy would an electron in the first shell, according to Bohr's model, in this case, first orbit, have? Oh. It's n equals 1. So 
yeah, plug in one, so one squared, and anything divided by one is exactly that number. Cool? So what would it be the energy of an electron right here? Yeah, this number divided by two squared, divided by four. Great. What about if an electron was in the third shell? That number divided by nine. If you notice, the shells keep going. Now it turns out as you get further and further and further away, these shells or these orbits in Bohr's model get closer and closer together. So they actually don't go on infinitely out to China or something like that. They hit a boundary at some point eventually, sort of, although you can make an argument that there's a calculatable probability that an electron on my cheek atom is in China right now, whatever. <laughs> so in this case though, the idea is this, what if I had the infinitieth shell? What would be the energy of the electron at that point? It'd be zero, because when you divide by infinity squared, you're dividing by a big fat number and you get zero. And so the idea is this. Do I have more energy when I'm in that infinitieth shell or when I'm in the first shell? Uh, again, the further you are away, the higher the energy, the closer you are to the nucleus, the lower the energy. So here's the deal. When I'm infinitely far away, what was the energy again? Zero. As you get closer and closer and closer in, it gets more and more negative. So it's kind of a weird thing. The highest is zero. The ceiling on this is zero for the energy of electron. And as you get closer to the nucleus, it gets more and more and more negative. So it's weird. So the charge on that, uh, the nucleus is positive. Yeah. OK. Cool. So let's say that this electron right here is like me driving my Toyota Corolla. So I got a Toyota Corolla. It's not worth 20 grand anymore. It's like eight years old. But let's just say it's a $20,000 car. I would love to get a Tesla, and not just any Tesla. I would like that new Tesla that just beat the Dodge Hellcat in a race, because that thing is awesome. So it's 110 grand. I looked it up. Good times, right? So, and let's just say that's my $20,000 Corolla, and this is the $110,000 Tesla. What needs to happen for me to go from a Corolla to a Tesla? What do I need to pick up? A really, really nice job. How much money exactly? $90,000. Would $89,000 cut it? No. no, I need exactly $90,000. So if you give me exactly $90,000, I'll go get my Tesla. If you give me anything less, I can't go get my Tesla. That's the way it works with an electron. If you give an electron exactly the amount of energy it needs to get to a different orbit, it'll go there. So if I give it exactly the amount of energy to get to the third, or the fourth, or something like that, it can get there, but not anything less, not even just a little bit less. It's got to be exactly enough. So it, so it states that when it goes from M1 to M3, it absorbs energy, but then when it goes from M3 to M1, it submits energy. Good. So to go from lower energy to higher energy, i.e. closer orbits to further orbits, you need to absorb energy. And how do we give an electron energy? What's the most common way? We give it light. And technically, you can actually charge this with like electricity or something too, but we want to talk about light in this chapter. And so here, it's only light of exact energies that are going to work. And that's the key. And every element is different. And it turns out the energies of the orbits for hydrogen, Bohr got those down pat. But for every other element, he's like, I don't know what's going on. My equations don't work. But I'm a genius. Keep telling me that. So, and we keep praising him to this day, even though he's dead. Whatever. <laughs> so. In this case, it turns out that these are the energies of the photons of light that get absorbed if you shine white light on it. Only the ones that correspond to this kind of a thing. And again, you might get out to two and then get hit by another photon and then go out to three or then go out to you know, four and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of different photons of light that can get absorbed by an atom. But every different element on the periodic table, its atoms will absorb a different set of photons. What's white light? What is white light? It's a combination of all the colors in the visible spectrum. And it turns out if you shine that white light, exactly, or from the sun, if you shine that white light through a prism, what does the prism do? Makes the color spectrum, Makes the color spectrum like the rainbow you saw yesterday and stuff like that. Turns out if you take white light shined through hydrogen gas and shine it through a prism, and it pulls it out so it gives you that nice spectrum, you'll see certain black lines of colors that are missing. And the colors that are missing are the ones the hydrogen gas has absorbed. And so it turns out, you know, if you shine white light through any, you know, different element, you'll get different lines missing in the spectrum. So this is how we know what the sun is made up of. If we take the white light coming off the sun, 
and we put it through a prism, we see certain colors missing. And it's the same colors missing if I'd just taken white light and shined it through hydrogen and helium on Earth. And so now we know that the sun is made up of hydrogen and helium, 75 to 25 ratio, so on and so forth. So that's how we know what stars are made up of and stuff like that. So it's from these absorption and emission spectra. So we can take this a step further. So do this for me once more. What is the energy of a photon and the energy of a photon required to go from shell one to shell two? I would need exactly that difference between those two. That exact energy would be the energy of the photon I would need to cause that electronic transition. Cool. Now, as you pointed out as well, to go from lower to higher, I need to absorb light. But if I'm an electron and I go from one, say, out to four, when I get out here, I look back at my nucleus, I'm like, oh, I used to love that nucleus so much, and I used to be so much closer. And so typically we call that an excited state, and they relax right back down, eventually going to make their way back down to the ground state. So, and as they go back down, as an electron relaxes down to a lower energy state, it's got to release the extra energy. So if I get rid of my Tesla and go back to a Corolla, I have to give $90,000 away, right? Same kind of thing here. In this case, instead of absorbing light, we're going to emit light. So we call that the emission spectrum. So if I take you know, hydrogen gas and charge it with electricity, instead of light charging with electricity, then I can watch as the electrons relax back down. I can see what colors of light are coming off. And that would be the emission spectra. And again, every element, you can kind of look at their absorption or emission spectra as a fingerprint telling you what element it is. Cool. Now, instead of just taking this number minus this number to find out what energy photon it would take, which we can do, they decide to combine it all into a lovely equation because we have this common factor in both. And so you can say that delta E equals negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules times 1 over n final squared minus 1 over n initial squared. So Final minus initial. Now, if you notice, it is always final minus initial for a delta, but if you notice, some people don't like to put that negative sign there, and they distribute that negative sign over here instead. And that ends up with, if you make this pi positive, then this can be 1 over n initial squared minus 1 over n final squared, and I don't like that myself, so I just always write it like this. It could technically show up either way. It's probably going to be an equation given to you on the front of your exam anyways. So, but whether you actually want to calculate the energy of, a of, a, sorry, of an electron in both of these and then take the difference between the two, or whether you want to use the entire equation here, life is good. But because this difference in energy equals the energy of a photon, well, if you know the energy of a photon, what else could I ask you about that photon? Uh, how much light it emits or how much energy it No, I mean, that is the energy. Uh, uh, but again, if you know the energy of a photon, look way on the far board there. What else can I ask you? I can ask you the wavelength or the frequency if I was really in a bad mood. So you should be prepared to calculate the difference in energy for the transition of electron going either direction. So, and you should be able to take that a step further, not just know that this is, that's the energy of the photon, either absorbed or emitted, but you can calculate the wavelength or frequency as well what using those equations. That's gonna be positive when it absorbs and negative when it emits. Yeah, delta E is positive when it absorbs, negative when it emits. If you're gonna calculate the wavelength or frequency though, always use the absolute value for delta E. Oh, oh. Yeah. Now one thing to note, we have a number of what we call series here. And these series involve uh, relaxing down, the part of the emission spectrum, relaxing down to lower energy shells. And if you start from any higher energy one, as long as you're always relaxing down, whoop, that's not what I want to do. As long as you're always relaxing down to the first shell, we would call that the Lyman series. And it gives a series of lines, and it turns out these will be the biggest energy gaps you can have when you go down to the first shell. And it typically corresponds to like ultraviolet light. So however, use a different color here, if you relax down from wherever you want to start, down to the second shell, and there'd be other ones out here and stuff like that, we call that the Balmer series. And it just means that when you're going down here, n final is two, and you're starting from somewhere higher than that, so it's an emission. And that's the Balmer series, and that's important. If you notice, it's bolded on your outline there because that's what typically corresponds to visible light. So you should know the Balmer series, B-A-L-M-E-R, corresponds to visible light. 
and it's when n final equals 2, and you're relaxing down to 2. So I put the Lyman and the Paskin and the bracket on there as well. Don't care. The bomber, which is in bold, is the important one. <laughs> 